If you study physics, mathematics, or engineering, there's a good chance that you have already encountered this equation. This is called an inhomogeneous wave equation because it has something to do with wave. It's in some sense inhomogeneous, and it is a linear differential equation. So let's talk about it. What you are looking at here is the same equation written in a different form. Most of the conciseness has been done here in this part. This is a linear differential operator, which is also called DL inversion operator. If I break it down, then this operator looks something like this. So this box squared is actually a set of operators which are written as negative the partial time derivative twice plus the Laplacian. Now there are two instances which readily comes into my mind when talking about this operator and this particular equation occurs in electromagnetism when talking about the topic of radiation and retardation and the second is when we are dealing with weak gravity and in the Lorentz gauge, the linearized Einstein's equation looks something like this. So if we can solve this equation here, then by using that form, we can pretty much solve it in any cases wherever we confront this equation. In this video, I'll try to solve it formally, and for that, we are going to employ a mechanism which is called the Green's Function Method. Now, this video is not aimed to introduce the theory of Green's Function. Now, the aim of the video is not to introduce the theory of Green's Function. That should be the subject of a separate video. What I'd like to do here is to use the concept of Green's Function to actually find out an explicit form of the solution for this equation. So that's why I'm briefly going to state how this Green's Function method works and then we'll jump right onto the solution. Ready? So this is our original inhomogeneous wave equation, right? Now, associated with every differential equation we want to solve by using Green's function, there is an associated differential equation which is written in terms of Green's function. And that equation looks something like this. Now this is the corresponding equation in terms of Green's function. Now it's a weird looking equation and I recognize that. And I'm going to explain the parts of it so that it starts to make sense. First of all, at the very left here, we are looking at the very operator that we are looking at here. So nothing changes. In our original equation, this should be our function. And in the solution, we should get an explicit expression for that. So in other words, this function which is written using psi is our solution. This is what we're trying to get. On the very right here, we are looking at a term which is not written in terms of psi. If it were, then we could bring it to the left and we can merge it with this operator or this expression on the left and then it wouldn't be an inhomogeneous equation. The very reason that this equation is called an inhomogeneous equation is because of this term on the right. And this term is called the source term. This is the reason why this solution psi is generated. In other words, this function f is the source for this function or field psi. Now, in the associated equation, in the place of psi, we see this function g, which is the Green's function. And just as we have called psi the solution of our original equation, g here is the solution of the associated equation. And we'll try to find out an explicit form for this function as well. In fact, if we can find out the explicit solution of this equation, then we are pretty much done. With the knowledge of boundary condition, we can readily write down the solution of our original inhomogeneous wave equation. On the right, in place of the source term, we have 
delta functions. Now, delta functions are very peculiar functions, and I'm not going to explain them in great details, but all I can say is that they are in some sense, quote-unquote, unit source. How is this delta function acting like a unit source? So let me draw a diagram, and by using that diagram, I'll try to create a compelling reason why this function, this delta function, will be helpful for us. Here, assume that the source moves like this. So this is the trajectory of the source, and at different time, the source is at different place, and we want to find out how to create this source. And let's say, this is the point where we are trying to find out the impact. Now this, there is nothing special about this point. This is just a general point I have chosen. And because there is no specialty of this point, except for the boundary, I can go anywhere. And the case I can make for this point, I can make the same case for this point as well. So that's interesting. Now focus on the trajectory of the source. This trajectory, or the effect of this source, can be recreated exactly by considering that the source appears at one of the places at a certain time, and then it readily disappears. Then again, at the next instant, another source appears here, and disappears again, and here, and disappears again, and subsequently here, and disappears again. So notice what is happening. It's recreating the trajectory in space and time. And this is the trajectory of the original source. And if I know how this unit splashes at a certain time at a certain place, impacts the solution of whatever quantity we're investigating here and here or anywhere, basically we are recreating our original situation. And by integrating over these sudden splashes of appearances and disappearances of our source, we can find out the exact response to the motion of the source. And that is basically the idea behind the Green's function. Now this is not exactly rigorous, or this may not exactly make sense. I will make other videos where I go through other problems in details, and I will link it below so that you can find out exactly what's happening. I will also create other videos on Green's function, and there is not just one single method, there are a couple of them, and once you have been versed in some of them, then it starts to unfold in front of your eyes the ideas about the mechanism that you might employ for solving a linear and homogeneous differential equation. But let's get back to our original case here now. Once we have found out our explicit expression for the Green's function, then the solution is very easy to write down. And let me write it down first, and later justify why this is the case. So the solution, which is this function psi, which is a function of the position and time, can be written as the integral over, this means four-dimensional volume by the way, the integral over the Green's function times the source term. There are other contributions from the boundary as well, so that's why I am also writing down the resultant terms from the boundary conditions. And this integral here is precisely the reason why I explained the response to a unit function and by integrating, in other words, by summing over the solution to the unit responses and multiplying that with the source term, we are actually recreating the complete response, in other words, the complete solution due to the source term f. Alright? So let me show you how we can arrive here. So our original equation reads negative double time derivative plus Laplacian acting on g is a function of two sets of coordinates. The first one is the coordinate of the sources, and the second one is the coordinate of the target. And that's why this works as the bridge, or the connector, or the propagator of the effect that the source creates in the desired region we'd like the solution to be found. 
And on the right hand side, we have negative delta r minus r prime delta t minus t prime. And this is the direct delta function, by the way. For shorthand notation, I will denote this whole part with a g only. I hope there is no confusion about that. What I would like to do now is to multiply this function psi in both sides, which is basically the solution, and integrate over time and space. So integrate and integrate, and this is a four-dimensional integration, which is basically simply integration over time and space, like this. We'd also like to change the sign in both sides of the equation, so this becomes plus and this becomes minus. And the integration on the right hand side is particularly simple. It gives us psi of r and t back. Now the integration on the left hand side is a complicated one and it requires careful consideration. And that's what we are going to do now. So just to be considerate, I would like to write down the complete expression we have just found here. And the complete expression looks something like the blue equation I've written here. Now one thing must be noticed is that this psi here has its arguments in terms of primed coordinate and that is explicitly shown here. This is the psi that we have written here and here. And since the integration took place over all the primed coordinate, after integration it disappeared and the only remaining thing that is left is the unprimed coordinate which is kind of the function of using the direct delta function. So be careful about that. Now for a brief moment I'd like to come back to this point once again. Because those of you who have studied the direct delta function before, you know that the right hand side is completely symmetric with respect to the primed and unprimed coordinates. Yes, the right hand side can also be written by exchanging the primes and the unprimed coordinates, which is shown here. Now because of the symmetry of the primed and unprimed coordinates on the right hand side, we can also expect that this symmetry will hold in the left hand side as well. And it does. In fact, we can write the derivatives in terms of the primed coordinate as well. So this would indicate that the linear differential operator can be written in terms of primed coordinate and we can also exchange the argument of the Green's function with respect to the primed and unprimed coordinates. So this gives us a great advantage to manipulate the integral expression that we have just arrived at, which is this one here. So I can rewrite this equation as almost everything remains the same, except for this little thing here is where we can exchange the primed and the unprimed coordinates. So that means the expression becomes this. And this gives us a great advantage. Why? So let's try to understand this. This integrand here is actually comprised of two terms. You can break it up, this operator here, into two parts, and this in turn will give us two different integrals. And between those two contributions, the first one will contain the special derivative, and the second one will contain the temporal derivative. So let's do the second term first, that means the one with the temporal derivative. So this is the second part of our integration. You can readily notice that we can carry out the integration in terms of the time variable twice by the method of integration by parts. So once we do that, what we arrive at is this expression here. The space derivative does not change and it holds on to each and every term because we haven't done anything with it. And then the integration over time the et prime and of course the double derivative of psi with respect to t prime times g. Notice the derivative has shifted from g onto psi. And of course there are boundary terms which I write here like this. Now let's go on to the first part which contained the special derivative. So this is the first part. So for simplicity let's now ignore this part and for now let us focus only on this part. Now how do we approach this? So recall the divergence theorem which can be written like this. The divergence of a vector field is when volume integrated over a volume is the surface integral of the flux over the surface of the volume. 
This is the divergence theorem, right? Written for simplicity. Now choose a equal to a scalar function phi times the gradient of another scalar function, which is written by the variant phi. Once we do that, we do the same thing for the inverse choice, which is the variant phi times the gradient of phi. Now, if we subtract one from the other, we get what we call the Green's identity. So let us call this choice number one, and let us call this choice number two. And as we have just explained, if we substitute this expression into this theorem, then for the first choice, we get this expression right here. And for the second choice, we get this expression right here. Now, if we subtract one from the other, what we get is the following. I forgot to put together the integration sign. So these two terms simply cancel out. And what we get is this. This is the famous Green's identity. And this is an essential part for writing down the solution in terms of Green's function. Now, you might be able to guess what we are going to do next. We are going to plug in psi instead of this and g instead of this. And so what we find out is because we were integrating over the primed derivative, that's why I'm putting a prime on here, and what we get is psi Laplacian primed Laplacian acting on the Green's function minus the Green's function times the Laplacian acting on the solution psi. And on the other hand, we have the corresponding surface integral. So this is our expression. Now one thing you can readily understand is why we have written it like this. It's because this term here is the delta, because of the associated Green's equation. So if you remember, this would simply be negative delta of the argument t minus t prime multiplied with another chronic delta function whose argument is r minus r prime. So because of this integral here, and by the way, remember, there is also a time integral, so it properly replaces all the primed functions and therefore this whole term here along with the time integration gives us psi of unprimed coordinate back. Because this video is getting longer and longer, I will break down the explicit solution in a separate video. But for now, if we put together all the findings that we have got up to this point, then it looks something like this. And while writing this expression, I am incorporating all the integrals, that means the time integral and the special integral as well. So psi of r comma t, this is the first term, and then this is the first boundary term, and this is the last boundary term. So I hope this video is helpful for you. This gives a brief overview on how the Green's function technique would work for the inhomogeneous wave equation. And on the next video, I'll show you a mechanism to derive the explicit form of the Green's function. Until then, stay with physics, stay with science.